I really appreciate the opportunity to be here as a clinician with some of these incredible scientists. Um, and I have really, really enjoyed and learned a lot today. I hope, hope everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have. I have a clinical talk. Uh, which patients benefit from PGS? And of course, that's built on the foundation of everything that you've heard all day today. But we'll go through it quickly, and I'll try not to be too long-winded uh, since I already took up some of my lecture uh, playing stats. Um, I'm the board of a not-for-profit that does this testing. I don't have any financial interests. You've already seen these data from Jason Frenesiak today from a couple of the speakers. I think all the different platforms have very similar graphs, and we certainly know that this is the biology. So this is the foundation of the question. There really is no age group. There really is no clinical setting where people are not at risk for aneuploid embryos. And as you've heard, aneuploid embryos don't lead to good things. And so that really is the, the core the core of this is that, of course, we want to know which embryos are aneuploid, because if you ask yourself this question, is there value in, when transferring an aneuploid embryo, can it ever be clinically useful? And the answer is it's truly aneuploid. It's really an abnormal embryo. Um, then the answer to that question is no. And our mosaics and segmentals create some gray zones. I think those are very interesting uh, and are going to be a bigger part of our future as we gain precision with more experience. So really it's just a matter of does the benefit of knowing, um, how does that balance work against the potential burdens of finding out? So uh, quite frankly, sometimes the patients have um, no aneuploid embryos. Then we didn't really help them, right? If everything's normal, we, did, we really didn't help them. What if, what if the uh, biopsy is adverse? And we'll talk, we first thing about that and we'll talk about it. Um, misdiagnosis, calling something confident that's not or vice versa, we've talked a lot about today and probably will for the rest of the day. Um, and there's just a lot of different things there. We did this study many years ago. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Where we actually biopsy took patients who were going to have two embryo transfers, biopsy one and not the other, put them back, did DNA fingerprinting. So it's a true paired study. Every patient has their own control. And we saw that trophecta during biopsy was better than day three. And that was very it was surprising. We actually did the study to prove it didn't matter, but unfortunately it did. And as I think Santi mentioned today, I think Santi said 98, 99% of his biopsies are now trophecta during, probably in reflection of those types of experiences. Um, it turns out that not all, not all trophectoderm biopsies are the same. And this is a, a project which is now, I think, accepted. It's not, it's not longer in interview, it's in press, uh, from Shelby Neal, who's one of our fellows, that looked uh, at a standard curve on number of cells in the initial amplification um, and subsequent amplification yield. And uh, you can see all the CTs, and we won't go through all the math, although we can if anybody wants. And I can tell you that it's not always linear. And so uh, 10 cells in a uh, loaded from a from fibroblast sign doesn't always correlate with 10 cells uh, into affected derm. They can be binucleated. There's a lot of things for that. But if you just look at the size of the biopsies, everything goes down as biopsies get bigger and bigger and bigger. The first take-home point for this, though, is that the average biopsy is probably eight or nine cells, which means all embryologists are evil and they lie about how many cells are in their biopsies. Doesn't, doesn't mean that at all. It just means they're really hard to see. It's really hard to count cells in a biopsy. No one's leaving the embryo out for that long. Speed is a big part of what makes this clinically successful. Um, so biopsies are probably a little more cellular than we think, and yet we should strive to make them smaller. These are two large pro uh, labs that send us specimens. Um, and we picked these two just because they're the two biggest, actually, of the 40 or so who send us specimens. And across the board, there is a very big distribution difference in terms of the number of cells attained in their biopsies. And in particular, if you look over here to the right, kind of that tail, which is very red off to the right side, one group does a lot more big biopsies than the other. And in fact, their implantation and delivery rates. So we do have a way to estimate the number of cells uh, in biopsies. We can't give you the exact number. I can't say it's seven versus eight or eight versus 10. What I can tell you is that it's on the larger side or on the smaller side, and that it correlates with outcomes. You've seen all these data. Here's, here's Yang's data. Young patients, benefit. Under 35, mean age of 31, very, very young patients, but benefit. Our study originally that showed benefit, uh, women 35, under the age of 35, actually. And so across the board, we did better. The control group obviously did well. They're, they're youngsters. 
Um, and then in the CCS trial that we did to compare one versus two, now obviously we have a difference in transfer order. Pregnancy rates are, are going to be impacted by that. But implantation rates are not necessarily going to be impacted by that. Um, and we saw a difference, 66 versus 51. And interestingly enough, uh, in that study, uh, across the board, um, women were up to age 42. And so this includes all age groups. And these differences with higher implantation rates became larger as women got older. And this is a randomized trial. And that's true, and it gets harped on all the time, although it's not statistically sound, uh, but it's true even in the to treat analysis, which was included in that and subsequent publications. The flip side of that is sort of would come up, and are some of those concerns about whether we should be doing this clinically come from this graph, which you've also seen today, which is we, we published our initial experience with SNP arrays, quantitative uh, SNP arrays, which said that about 4% of embryos that we transferred and said, hey, that's abnormal uh, in a blinded non-selection study, actually deliver. So in that study, you biopsy the embryo and you put it back and you don't wait for the answer. You have no idea what's going to happen. And you wait, they go all the way through the pregnancy, and then you analyze the biopsy and you see whether or not the, the predictive value um, in terms of what you would have called the biopsy at the time was borne out by the clinical performance of uh, implantation and loss uh, and ultimately those that were ongoing. Uh, with QPCR, we've done this, and it's about 98%. But 2 to 4% is a real number. Um, and you saw this data earlier from Nathan just a moment ago. This is just the interim analysis we did on our next-gen LCT. Uh, the numbers now are about two and a half times as big, and the findings are the same. Uh, in that particular study, none of the embryos in the non-selection arm that were put back that were labeled abnormal by the test actually implanted and progressed. Some implanted and miscarried but it's not implanted and progressed. Do I think that there will be errors with NextGen, or is it now perfect? Of course there'll be errors. There's all kinds of biologic reasons, and some very legitimate analytical reasons, and these, these tests are not going to be perfect. Um, but I think that the error rate is low. And so going in, your patients need to be aware that somewhere between 1% and, and 3% or 1% and 4% of the embryos that we call abnormal could, in fact, be reproductively competent. Perhaps now that we're doing uh, segmental abnormalities like duplications and deletions and mosaicism, we're going to tighten those numbers up and do a little bit better job because some of those ones where we found errors uh, really did look like mosaics. We just didn't have criteria at the time for making those calls. This is a, a study from Marie Warner, one of our, our fellows who's now joined our faculty, and said, what's the clinical error rate? Because this, again, influences who you do this on. What's the clinical error rate on the other side? If you say it's normal, how often does it become abnormal? And in the first just under 5,000 embryos, 3,200 transfers, there were 10. And this has been borne out now by the next 50,000 uh, embryos as well. It's about the same rate. Uh, one was tetraploid. We're coming up with ways to detect uh, triploidy and tetraploidy, but at the time there was none. Two were monosomies, seven were trisomies, three were ongoing, seven were found in losses. Um, and so uh, there are real errors. Embryos that we say nor are normal are not always normal, um, but the error rates were low. For embryo, it's about 0.2% clinical error rate. The ones that don't implant, we don't know. How could we? But of the ones that are implanted and are ongoing pregnancies or get to the point of miscarriage where we can evaluate the products of conception, the error rate per embryo is about 0.2%, per transfer is about 0.3%, per ongoing pregnancy is 0.1%. Put that in a clinician's terms when talking to patients. We can make a 42-year-old have the same overall aneuploid gestation that she had at 23 or 24. So that's a, that's a good step in the right direction for those patients, and they relate to that very well. We dramatically lower miscarriage risk. Uh, it's still relatively high because we don't really get rid of biochemical losses. We don't really get rid of biochemical losses. This is perhaps the most important reason to do PGS. So in a world where patients have limited access to care and limited resources, money is very important, patients put back too many embryos, well, because either they can't afford to keep going or they're just emotionally and physically exhausted by this process. And these are data from a New England Journal article about two years ago now that talked about the fact that uh, an enormous percentage of uh, the twins over here are still coming from medically assisted IVF and non-IVF. Note that IVF twins are increasing. Triplets are on the way down, but we still uh, contribute the vast majority of the triplets. Some of that's through ovulation induction. That's the purple line, but the green line 
uh, while on the way down is certainly not gone. And so transfer order becomes uh, a great thing. And if we've seen three or more go down in the United States, uh, two embryo transfers have increased. Single embryo transfers have also increased, but mostly it's still two embryo transfers if you look across the board. If you walk around at the ASRM, it's miraculous that everyone does all single embryo transfers. But when you look at their data, you might find that there's a few more twos, uh, two more hiding in there. And people have advocated for saying, you know, twins not so bad. And if my patients get twins, I do not cry. I would, I, I'm happy to have two better than zero, and I would agree with that. But that's, that's a really bad attitude. And I'm guilty of it, but I'm, it's not what we should be seeking. We should be seeking singletons. Because the preeclampsia risk is extreme prematurity. I'll show you data in a minute. NICU, perinatal death twice as high. Cerebral palsy six times as high. These are not benign things. Can you imagine as a parent, for those of you who have kids, any decision that you would make to save a month in the life of your children that would give them a six-fold increased risk of cerebral palsy? Who would make that choice? No one would make that choice. It's silly. And, and, and that doesn't even begin to deal with perinatal death and all the other things that go along with that. People have tried to resolve this by doing randomized trials and say, let's just put back one. If we're really selective by looking at morphology, we can be as good as two. Six trials, 1,200 patients, no dice. Doesn't work, uh, regrettably. And uh, Eric Foreman's trial, where we did a single euploid versus two unscreened, Right? So it's not exactly the same. It's not one versus two. It's one screen versus two. Obviously, all single things. We had no monozygotics in the best side, and the single embryo side. We had about half of the pregnancies as multiples, including one monozygotic that turned into triplets on the other side. But this is the most exciting data. 3,400 grams versus 2,700 grams um, for overall mean birth weight. So these data were published in the Gray Journal by Eric Foreman. It'll show up at the bottom somehow in a second. There is no intervention in the history of obstetrics that has produced an increase in mean birth weight at 650 grams. Not one thing that's ever been done that's as positive, as meaningful for reducing morbidity and mortality as that right there. That is the most effective thing ever done, and we can do it by being more selective, and we can do it by, without compromising outcomes by using PGS. I to go forward. Low birth weight, 4% versus 32%. And by the way, this 2700, that didn't just include the twins. That's all comers, including the ones that were singletons. 32 versus 4, all comers. Very low birth weight, 7 versus 0. And so the, the differences are just enormous. When you look at days in the NICU, uh, these are the days of NICU admission for the two embryo transfer group, all comers, versus the single embryo transfer group. This one patient was a patient who was delivered electively early because she developed a malignancy. Still counts in the data, got to be out there, but the reality is it's very unlikely outside of a, an elective delivery that that baby would have been born that early and spent that much time in the NICU. Huge differences in safety and huge differences in costs when you look across the board, even within the initial admission, not counting the long-term NICU costs and the long-term costs of all of that. Additionally, as you use PGS more in your program, these are our data from our clinic, all age groups, all comers. Youngsters do a little better, older patients do a little lesser. These are the sustained implantation rates, the probability that a transferred embryo turns into a baby. In the 20s and 30s, back in the mid-2000s, and now in the 60s and 70s. It's enormously impactful on outcomes for patients. And because of that, transfer order changes. We used to do two embryo transfers, even some three or more. Three or more has been gone now for, for almost six years. And single embryo transfer continues to rise. And in fact, uh, looking at our year-to-date results through the first two quarters, when we do CCS, 91, 92% of the time we're single embryo transfer. We do have a few 45-year-olds in, in these cases where implantation rates are not as good, where we will still put back more than one, but not often. It's only about 50-50 in our non-screening patients. This is a study done by one of, the, one of the insurance companies in our area, and this speaks to the issue of cost effectiveness, because that's part of that burden. That's part of the reason not to do it. And they went back and looked at their internal cost per delivery. It's a big national insurance company. They asked me not to use their name. They did allow me to use their data. National average cost them about $72,000 uh, for care to get a baby born to an infertile couple. 
uh, and regional average was about the same, actually, for the Northeast. When we do single embryo transfer with CCS, that goes down by approximately half. I have. So as the medical director for that group said, it makes all of their infertility care cheaper than free. Because what we're saving on the obstetrics and pediatric side is enormously, enormously impactful. There's no question, this is the most cost-effective thing you can do when providing care to patients. So what class of data we have? Under 35, we have two studies with implantation rate, not pregnancy, but implantation rates, well, we're up to uh, age 42 uh, and actually showing increasing effect with, with increasing maternal age. We have data up to 42. We don't have prospective data because there really isn't a way to, to randomize people to an AMH level. But if you look at people with good AMHs, and we'll talk about low responders in a second, it really doesn't matter what your diagnosis is. You need euploid embryos, no matter who you are, and it really doesn't matter why you're infertile, it's impactful. If you look at women less than or equal to 42, and we look across the board at their AMH level, if they get a euploid blast, probability of that certainly changes, but if they get a euploid blast, we don't see differences in outcomes. I think these are very consistent, perhaps not as elegantly presented, but very consistent data that Santiago Monet showed with number of uh, oocytes and embryos showing that they maintained their euploidy rate and their implantation rates. And so across the board, euploids still do uh, very, very well. Our group these were a couple years of data just from the RMA data. Um, across the board, delivery rate per embryo transfer, uh, sustained implantation rate, we actually see a diminution by the time, that's statistically definable by the time people in their late 30s. We don't see a complete correction of that age-related diminution, even though they do much, much better and their delivery rate's still in the 60s per embryo transfer. And obviously it, it falls down to about 58.7 or something like that in 41 to 42, and it drops off a little more at 43. So it's not perfect. It's not a panacea. We have work to do to, to get the rest of those patients helped and, and pregnant, uh, but it certainly does very, very well. We are doing a large, long-term, randomized trial on low responders. I think, gosh, why low responders? Why people who make one, two, three eggs? Because there's going to be very little opportunity for selection. And the answer is, I agree, there's going to be very little opportunity for selection. This is an ongoing study because it includes cumulatively up to three cycles. We're looking at things like time to conception, probability of an ongoing aneuploid abnormality, loss risk, loss time of care, and ultimately cumulative delivery rate uh, across the board in this. Uh, one of my fellows started this study. It's been very difficult to recruit. He is certain he will get it completed before he retires at the end of his career. Um, but the reality is we're probably about a year from having this done um, because uh, you need relatively big numbers and these patients are relatively difficult to recruit. But we're going to have class one data to answer those critical questions because the burden of clinical losses, particularly in older patients who are the ones at highest risk for their response, is quite high and the loss time is quite painful. I close in just in the last couple of minutes while I try to catch up on time here. Recurrent loss in aneuploidy. Uh, the reality is, is that um, to some extent, recurrent loss in aneuploidy is inversely proportional. If you, if you have a patient, and, and I think Dr. Monet has already done a great job of, of talking about the Stanford paper, but I'll bring it up in a moment just briefly. But if you have a patient who comes to recurrent loss, and they've had seven clinical losses, and you screen five blasts, and they're all euploid, what are the odds that aneuploidy is really their problem? Probably pretty low. So what happens when you put those embryos back? They miscarry a lot, right? So recurrent loss isn't one thing. We've got to put lumping them all together. And if you look specifically at those people who actually have high aneuploidy rates, they do great. When they have a bunch of aneuploid embryos and you pluck out the one normal, then they do very well and you get excellent delivery and relatively low loss rates. If aneuploidy is the problem, then aneuploidy screening helps. If aneuploidy is not the problem, then aneuploidy screening probably doesn't help them very much and they have another etiology for their losses. Uh, so I'll do, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend all this time talking about this paper and, and Santi, uh, I think, covered it beautifully and, and talked about the fact that patients who didn't do PGS were put into the, the PGS results group because they were of the attention to treat analysis. The reality is that in that kind of study, if you're going to, if you say you're going to do it, do it even if it's one. Do it even, no matter how few injuries you have, do it so you can get the actual aneuploidy data and the outcome data. There are many, many, many problems. There was one of those email alerts that came out from HR saying 
that we have determined the true state of nature and the PGS doesn't work for a current loss, I think it depends on the kind of a current loss you have. So I'll close by uh, discussing an abstract that will be at the ASRM this year uh, from Shelby Neal, who's our first year fellow. Well, we took AHC, ASRM average costs for fresh transfer if you finish the cycle, or embryo biopsy, PGS, vitrification, and an FET cycle. And then we looked at what's the, what's the real cost just for the reproductive integrative care? Because the patient doesn't pay for their pediatric care or their obstetric care, right? So what's just the cost of that patient? Because the reality is, is that you can say put them back one at a time. For that 41-year-old, that's a clinical catastrophe. That's a clinical catastrophe. There's very few things you could do more harmful than that to your patient. Because if they've got five abnormal embryos and it takes you a year to get them back, they're now a year older and the outcome was preordained before you started. And so there is a price to not knowing and doing a bunch of fuel transfer cycles is not cheap. I mean, this doesn't even take into account things like miscarriage costs and time loss from work, et cetera, et cetera. So if you do no PGS, uh, the reality is, is you end up spending about $7,900 uh, to, um, to get to a delivery. And if you do PGS, $7,200, but your average time of care is reduced by about eight months. So who benefits from CCS? Certainly normal and high responders through age 42. I think the data are unequivocal. Low responders, we don't know yet. I think that the, the, the advantages to knowing are powerful for these patients, but I don't know that you can tell them they have a better outcome. It may qualitatively change their outcomes. And recurrent loss really needs an RCT that's stratified by the type of losses that the patient is having. Uh, we certainly don't have those data at, at the current time. That I'd like uh, to thank my team. Nathan's already done this, particularly my fellows who we use as slaves and do all the work. Thank you very much.